Well, good morning. We greet you this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome you to the Lord's house as we begin this day together uh, in worship. Let me make you aware of several things that are happening in the life of the church that you can find in the back of your bulletin. I want to draw your attention to some key elements of, of things that are upcoming on the schedule. Uh, first off, on today is that uh, we will have a new Sunday school rotation. Uh, as always at Woodruff Road, we figured out how to do this efficiently. efficiently. We, we don't make you rotate. We make the teachers rotate and come to you, so go to your regular Sunday school class, but that will start up today. Uh, if you're a visitor with us this morning, we're delighted that you've chosen to worship here at Woodruff Road. want to uh, invite you to uh, stick around after uh, the benediction this morning. Uh, come join us for a time of fellowship. Just go, go down the hallway to your right. You'll find people moving in that direction, and you'll smell coffee and, and come and, and, and enjoy a little bit more fellowship there. And then stay around afterwards for the visitor Sunday school class. Uh, that class happens uh, right back there in the training room. You have to go out of the sanctuary and loop back around. And, uh, but Pastor Dodds will be in there, and he'll be teaching again this morning. Um, our, uh, we also want to remind you about the College Plus class, uh, Silas. Uh, Menezes will be teaching that class in the church library, so if you haven't been a part of that, then, then this would be a great morning to jump in and join uh, with him uh, in that. Uh, as far as um, other things that you need to know about parents, if you are sending kids to camp this summer, uh, I want to remind you to get the balance of your payment in for that. That's both for the middle school and the high school. If you have any questions, see me this morning. I'll, uh, I'll help you out with those. I uh, also want to remind you about the baby shower for Jesse, Jesse Ewing. Uh, that happens on May 15th. Um, that's two weeks from today. Uh, also, May 23rd will be a pie fellowship Sunday evening after our worship. Uh, we'll have a good time of, of fellowship down there. And I want to remind you, this is not from the, the fellowship committee per se, but I just want to remind you, savory is a kind of pie too, and pizza is sometimes referred to as pie. So if you want to really mix it up this year, um, that's a way that you could, you could do that. Uh, also looking ahead, we are, we are uh, in the throes of preparation for Vacation Bible School. And again, we are still taking volunteers for that. It takes an army uh, of volunteers to run a good program. And so we'd encourage you, if you haven't done so already, uh, go ahead and go online or go in the back of the Narthex and sign up uh, back there. And uh, if you don't know what your part is, that you put your name down as a willing volunteer and we will find your part uh, for you in that. Uh, likewise, if you are a parent, it's also time for student registration for uh, Vacation Bible School. That's uh, rising first graders through rising uh, seventh graders. Part of that program, rising sixth and seventh graders will be part of a special program that's, that's separate from the regular VBS. So if you're already in, in middle school and you're thinking, I don't want to go back to VBS, I'm, I've outgrown that. Well, you haven't outgrown my version of it. So, so just uh, go ahead and plan on signing up there. Uh, and to remind you again, uh, th uh, Vacation Bible School is open to all our members, uh, to all of our regular attenders, visitors who've been with us, and, and also family members. Uh, who, we've had family members over the years come and bring their children to be a part of it. We want to welcome them as well. Uh, so, so, but make sure you sign up by the deadline, May 23rd, uh, because that, there is a limitation on space for it. Uh, again, reminding you earlier that we have uh, Worship this evening at 6 p.m., and we always want to keep the whole Lord's Day holy, so we invite you to come back and be a part of our worship at 6 p.m. Uh, and then, ladies, to stay around afterwards. There will be a pounding uh, for one Delaney Dowling, who is the fiancé uh, of my uh, beloved son, Clay. And just if you don't know what happens at a pounding, a pounding is where you, you sort of stock a young couple's pantry with, with needed items to get them going. Now, we don't do it quite in the same way we used to because... Um, kind of awkward to bring in a pound of flour and, and do all that kind of stuff. So a lot of people do gift cards. But I just want you to remember that, that Mrs. Anderson and I have worked very hard to bring Clay up and to keep him alive up to this point. And so the, the, the pounding is a vital part of getting them through the first few weeks of their, of their marriage and making sure Clay continues to be fed. So if you would just help us out with that, it would give, it would give Mrs. Anderson great comfort uh, in that. Again, that'll, that'll happen tonight after the benediction. Make your way down to the youth room, and it will be set up uh, down there. Again, if you're a visitor with us this morning, we've already invited you to come, but I want to invite you to do one more thing. If you look in front of you in the pew rack, there is a blue uh, visitor information card. Uh, you can fill that out right now. When the offering plate comes by late in the service, you can drop that in. Uh, or you could also give it to myself, one of the other pastors, and we would be happy to, to, to make your acquaintance today, get to know you a little bit better. So we're glad you're here. Now let's turn our attention to the reason that we are here this morning, that is to worship the triune and living God. And we do so in the presence of Christ. Our Christ we know as our prophet, as our priest, and as our king. 
And you'll see that even in how we worship him this morning. As our prophet, uh, he will speak to you by his word. In the reading and the preaching of the word, you will hear from Christ, who is the ultimate prophet. As your priest, he will assure you, even as, as uh, Ruling Elder Johnson prays, he makes intercession for the congregation. It's through the intercession that Christ himself makes for you, that higher and greater intercession that ensures that prayers are heard and that sins are forgiven. And finally, you will worship Christ as your king. He will receive the offerings that you give to him. He will receive the praise that you give to him in song. And he will lay claim to your obedience as the word is applied to your heart. And so when you come this morning, know that you come worshiping God through Christ, your Redeemer. So prepare now for worship. Here now as God from his own word calls you into his worship. Psalm 84. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. I ask you now to take your Psalter hymnals, turn to hymn number 214. We will stand together and sing, sing praise to God who reigns above. That's hymn number 214.
As you remain standing, would you now take your bulletins and together we will confess our faith and we'll do so using the historic Apostles' Creed. It's historic not only in the sense of almost 2,000 years old, but it's historic in what we confess, that we believe historical facts about who our Savior is. And so, Christian, I ask you, what do you believe? I believe in If you remain standing, would you now take your Bibles and turn with me for our Old Testament reading to the book of Psalms in Psalm 143. You can also note that in your bulletin is printed a response to the reading of God's Word. You know, the Word of the Living God from Psalm 143, the Psalm of David. Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications. In your faithfulness, answer me, and in your righteousness, do not enter into judgment with your servant. For in your sight, no one living is righteous. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in darkness like those who have long been dead. Therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the work of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. Answer me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down into the pit. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will. For you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your, righteous, your righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. In your mercy, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul. For I am your servant. Faith comes by hearing. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we have the privilege of receiving into communing membership Patrick and Mallory Roof, along with their Covenant children, Josiah and Benham and Abigail. I'm going to ask them to come stand out here to my left. We have you good and boxed in here now, so you can't go anywhere. Um, membership in the Church of Christ is, is, is marked out by Christian baptism. That's how we, we have membership in the visible church. And it's a sign of the, the saving work of God. It's the sign of that which is received by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is that, the gift of grace that God gives to those who are so undeserving. He washes us and makes us clean. As we said, it is a visible sign of membership in the visible church. And There is also another kind of membership. There is membership in the invisible church. That is the church which corresponds to the one in glory. Who is going to be 
uh, with Christ in the new heavens and the new earth. And part of the way that we point to that is by our profession of faith in Christ. Because we distinguish between those who have professed faith in Christ and openly identify with him, we make a distinction between those who, uh, who have a mature understanding of that faith and who make vows and those who are not, re- not yet ready for that. And that those receive the sign of the covenant but, but do not become communion members at this point. Communion membership in the church is, is a great privilege to those who come. It is, significant, it is significant because it points to a deeper fellowship in the body of Christ. When you take vows that are shared with other members of the church, uh, you've gone somewhere with them. You've done something together even in that. There's also the benefit of receiving the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, a privilege for those that, that belong to the visible church by their profession of faith. And also with it, there is the, the privilege of being marked out from the world to say that you belong to a distinct body and have a distinct fellowship with them. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 2, 4, and 5. He says that we come to Jesus as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. And he says, you also as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You receive an obligation when you become a member of the church as well, not only privileges, but obligations. You testify to those in the vows that we'll make here in, in just a moment, but the, the chief obligation is that, that you commit to being a part of this body, being the spiritual house that it is, that is designed to give worship to God. And so that is the chief obligation you have is to come here and to be a worshiper of Christ. Let me ask you to, to very briefly rehearse your testimony, not in many words. So I want you to respond by saying, I do. But I want, you to, I want you as the congregation to hear them make those same vows that they recognize who they are in terms of their sin, and they recognize the answer to who they are in terms of their sin being found in Jesus Christ, and they're willing to be a partner in this with you and under the discipline of the church. So again, let me ask you those questions you've answered before the elders of the church. Do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope save in his sovereign mercy? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he's offered to you in the gospel? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ? Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? And finally, do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? Look behind you over there at your uh, ruling elder, Ron Hoyle. That is, that is part of the government and discipline of the church. Uh, whenever you make those vows, you're... you're vowing to be in submission to receive the leadership that's offered by men such as him. He's a good one, um, and there are others like him. All right, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege of testifying publicly uh, to who we are in Christ. We thank you for Patrick and Mallory and their acknowledgement of their need for what only Jesus can offer. And thank you as well, Lord, for the, the claim that they have on the work of the Holy Spirit, their dependence upon him, and we pray that you would so fill them and enable them and equip them and their being in this church, they might fulfill the vows they've just made, that you would increase their fellowship and also their service, that in belonging to the body, their gifts would be used for your glory, for the building up of the rest of the brothers and sisters here. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Today you see Patrick and Mallory bringing their entire household for baptism. You see Josiah Crosby, who did get the memo to wear a bow tie like Pastor Anderson. And you see Benham Patrick, who, by the way, Josiah is five, Benham Patrick is two, and Abigail Mallory is almost one month old. For those of you who were here on Wednesday night, she had her soft opening that night. Today's her hard opening. So just want you to know, and I've already been informed that she has her dad's hair, that hair that you see. Now, when we talk about household baptisms, this pattern conforms very closely to the dominant pattern of the New Testament. For example, we think of what Paul wrote to the Corinthian church to remind them of his connection to them. He said, by the way, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I baptized the whole household of Stephanos. Or you remember that great chapter that we cited just a few weeks ago when the Thompson children were baptized, uh, looking at the baptism of Lydia. Lydia alone believed, but her whole household was baptized. The Philippian jailer alone believed his whole household was baptized. Every time a covenant child, or at least a child of one believing parent, is baptized, 
there ought to be five things going through your mind because you're so fixated on, those kids are really cute. I wonder if that water is warm and boy, that girl has a lot of hair or things like that is what you're thinking. But what you ought to be thinking is these five things. First of all, baptism was instituted by Jesus Christ. In the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, what we are seeing is not a really cute sign that was dreamed up by, by party planners. What this was, this was instituted by the Lord Jesus Christ. The second thing you should see is this is a sign. It's a picture of something. It represents the blood of Christ which takes away all sin. The third thing that you should be thinking is that in this sacrament, God is making promises to believers and their children promising to be their God. This is a sign of promise to Patrick and Mallory. And then fourth, you should be reminded of what the Lord Jesus thought of this. The Lord Jesus admitted little children like these three into his presence. He embraced them, he blessed them, and he said, of such is the kingdom of God. The fifth thing you should be thinking is that by baptism, these children, Josiah and Benham and Ab Abigail, are being marked out today. Just as surely as circumcision marked out the children of the old covenant, baptism marks out the children of the new. It distinguishes them from the world. And they are brought in now to the visible church, which is the household of faith. Patrick and Mauer, you've already answered a bunch of questions, but let me ask you three more. Do you acknowledge Josiah and Benham and Abigail's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? We do. Secondly, do you claim God's covenant promises on their behalf and do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation as you do your own? We do. And finally, do you now, without reservation, dedicate Josiah, Benham, and Abigail to God and promise relying upon divine grace that you'll strive to set before them a godly example, that you'll pray with them and for them, that you'll teach them all the doctrines of our holy religion, and that you'll strive by all the means that God has appointed to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We do. If you as the congregation, you have a role too. God has so designed us as corporate and covenantal beings that you too can take vows on behalf of these parents and say, we are knit together now. You're part of this congregation. And so I want to take vows saying, I will assist you. And so in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand and respond to the question with, we do. Let's stand together and respond. Do you as the congregation of Woodruff Road undertake the shared responsibility of assisting Patrick and Mallory Roof with the Christian nurture of Josiah, Benham, and Abigail? We do. Maybe seated. Josiah, let me have you over here. here. You can stand right here. Josiah Crosby Roof, child of believing parents, heir of all the promises of God, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, Benham, who's only two years old, Benham Patrick Ruth, son of believing parents, heir of all of the promises of God, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. And now, Abigail. Abigail. Mallory Roof, daughter of the covenant, heir of all of the promises of God's mercy and his kindness. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for these three, for Josiah, for Benham, for Abigail, Lord, that you've now placed your mark upon them, that mark and that sign of promise. And so we pray for every blessing to be poured out on this household. We think of the household of Lydia, the household of the Philippian jailer, the household of Stephanos, and how you thought that it was right and good that these households, in the pages of the New Testament, should receive this mark. And you bless them. And so, Lord, we pray now that you would bless these children, that they would grow up 
never even being able to remember a day when they didn't love the gospel and love Christ, that you'd be so pleased to give them a new heart at the earliest possible opportunity, that they would love to repent, they would love to believe, they would love the Lord's day, the Lord's word, the Lord's people, but especially they would love the Lord Jesus Christ and flee to him as their only hope for eternal life. So Lord, pour out your blessings, not because of Patrick and Mallory's deserving, but because of your covenant grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Josiah, Benham, Abigail, welcome to the household of faith. Proverbs 19.23, we read this, The fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. It's another simple reminder that the safest and most satisfying place that you could ever be found is to be found with Christ himself. And the ways we testify that are manifold. It's by belonging to the visible church. It's by participating in worship. And it's certainly by seeking the kingdom by the giving of our tithes and offerings. We want to be found in him. We want our trust to be in him. And so we evidence it even now as we give to him and seek his kingdom in this manner. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, we do pray now that you would perfect that which we offer. Lord, we know that our hands are tainted with sin, but we also know the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ can overcome our sin. We also know that by your great wisdom that you can make use of those things that we offer and that you can receive them and they can become the blessing they ought to be. We pray, Father, that what is given today would be for the exaltation of Jesus Christ, for the gospel of his work on behalf of sinners and the magnitude of your mercy that can be found in him. And pray even so that gospel would go into the the far parts of the world by the giving done today, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Y'all please join me in a prayer of thanksgiving and supplications. Father, it is written in your word, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Father, how could we ever even begin to thank you for your love and for what you have done for us? Our redemption in itself is sufficient cause for wondrous and joyful celebration. Our adoption into your family is cause for even more awe-inspiring wonder and gratitude. Our being united to Christ <clears throat> is an unfathomable source of great thankfulness. And to actually be indwelt by your spirit is a most moving, beautiful, uplifting, and humbling cause for rejoicing. We praise and thank you, blessed Trinity. We especially thank you, Father, that before the foundation of the world, though no good existed in us, <clears throat> you, by your grace alone, chose and elected us unto salvation and appointed us to eternal life. We thank you that in the defining act of love and sacrifice, you gave your most beloved son and struck him that we might be justified. And we thank you that you have with much long suffering and patience, most tenderly and lovingly, born with one so unworthy as ourselves. We thank you especially, blessed spirit, for convicting us of our sin when we knew it not, for removing our hearts of stone and creating new hearts within us, for giving us the gifts of saving faith and repentance unto life. We thank you for leading us to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, thereby removing the gnawing burden of sin and guilt from our backs and releasing us from its bondage. We thank you, blessed Spirit, for being the guarantee and seal of our salvation and for upholding us at each and every moment lest we fall. We thank you, blessed Spirit, for being our helper, our teacher, and our reminder. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our most blessed and precious man of sorrows, for grievously suffering, ridicule, and cruel torment to die in our place. We thank you for descending into hell on the cross and bearing the full wrath of God for us, that we might be clothed in your righteousness and you branded with our sin. For it is with your stripes that we are healed and made whole. You have most surely purchased true peace, true rest, and true freedom for us. And we also thank you, praise the Lord Jesus, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Father, we at Woodruff Road have so much to additionally thank you for. We thank you for sustaining our church through a year fraught with disease and difficulty. We thank you for your wonderful financial provision for us in the last year for the tithes and offerings of your children, for coming in way over our budget, and for having a very healthy deacon's fund. We thank you for giving your officers wisdom about when to start back on our full worship service. We thank you for all our visitors, for all our new members, and for potential new members. We thank you for all your graciousness to us. Father, we also have some weighty requests to lay before you this morning. We pray that you will give guidance to our session and diaconate as we begin to look at the need for possible building programs in the near future. We pray for our upcoming General Assembly, for strong stands on your word and its teachings. We pray for the Gospel Reformation Network in Birmingham this week that you give wisdom and direction to all there. Father, we pray for our nation as our culture 
degenerates and crumbles before our very eyes. The Christianity once respected, now openly ridiculed in the media and derided by comedians. We see you banned from public life by our officials. In some areas, we see churches forcibly prohibited from opening. We see good called evil and evil called good as those who hate you and stand for evil no longer even know how to blush, but rather glory in their perverseness and parade it openly for all to see. Father, please send revival to our land. But Father, our trials in America are minuscule compared to those of our brothers and sisters throughout the world. We see mass killings of Christians all over the world. In the Middle and Far East, from Arabia to China, open wars waged against your people. Throughout Africa, the children of Ishmael practice open genocide against your people. Father, please restrain Satan and give sustaining grace to those persecuted. Closer to home, Father, even in Canada, we see churches closed and surrounded by barbed wire and guards and members forced underground. And at home, our government is at best pathetic are unsympathetic in their plight to Christians abroad and increasingly hostile to your children at home. Father, we as your people have much to repent of here. We have largely remained silenced against attacks on the name of Christ. And we have not prayed as much or as frequently or as fervently for our brothers and sisters being persecuted abroad. Father, please forgive our complacency Please drive us to our knees for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world and to pray for revival at home. And blessed Holy Spirit, help us in all these matters. Teach us what we need to know and do and remind us lest we neglect to pray. It's in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Our New Testament reading is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, just a few verses there, verses 25 and 26. Once again, we'll stand to give honor to the reading of God's Word. Again, from the New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 14, beginning in verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So you remain standing, take your Psalter hymnals again and turn to hymn number 245. We'll remain standing to sing Great is Thy Faithfulness, hymn 245.
Just a few moments ago, we as a congregation confessed those words from the ancient Apostles' Creed, I believe in the Holy Ghost. We regularly join our voices with believers from the last 1920 years and with believers from every nation in the world today. It's great and orthodox to confess those words with the church, but if you don't know what those words mean, they're empty ramblings. A couple of weeks ago, we saw that Jesus on this last night before the cross is desirous to instruct his disciples on the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Four times during the upper room discourse or the farewell discourse, Jesus teaches on the role of the Holy Spirit. I hope you have your Bible open to John 14 because what I want you to see is how Jesus addresses it, revisits, revisits, reviews this, this subject. So, for example, in John 14, verse 16 and following, you see the Lord Jesus bringing up the person and work of the Spirit. And then today we will see it again in chapter 14, verse 26. We'll see it again in chapter 15, verse 26 in a few weeks. And then we'll see it again in John 16, verses 7 through 14. And what we saw was our Lord's pedagogical method is repetition and building. It's sort of like algebra. It One builds on another. Now let me remind you what we saw on our Lord's first pass. Look at verses 16 and 17. We saw that Jesus teaches that the Spirit will be sent by the Father, according to verse 16, that the Spirit will be, verse 17, deeply interested in truth, and that the Spirit's presence will only be known by the believer. The unbeliever knows nothing of the person, the work, the indwelling of the Spirit. And we see then in verse 17 that the Spirit will indwell the believer. Today we will see our Lord's second pass at the Holy Spirit's person and work. Look at verse 25 and 26, where Jesus teaches on what the Holy Spirit will do when he comes and indwells the believer. Now, let me encourage you not to check out and excuse yourself in this moment and say, what Carl is talking about is for really super spiritual, really intelligent, mature people. What we're going to see is, is that Jesus promises the active ministry of the Holy Spirit to every regenerate person. And one of the primary things he's doing takes place in settings just like this. Now let me remind you the larger picture of where we are. If you look at John 14, we're now almost to the middle point of the upper room discourse. And when we are looking at John 14, we are firmly set on a Thursday night Passover celebration in Jerusalem with an upper room. The 12 disciples have gathered with our Lord there to celebrate Passover, and as Jesus brings them into the room, he disrobes, kneels at each of their feet, and he washes them, washes all the road dust off of their feet. And then after he finishes, Jesus stands up, and he begins to make predictions and prophecies, first of all about one of them betraying him. That's Judas, who quickly leaves the room and also one who will deny him three times. That's Peter, who stays but wants to argue with Jesus about that. He gives them the new commandment to love one another as he has loved them. Then Jesus, seeing that they're troubled, he begins to comfort them. He speaks of a heavenly home prepared for his disciples. He tells them he'll send the spirit of truth to indwell them. He tells them if they love him, they will do his commandments. And he tells him if they do keep his commandments, they'll be loved by the Father and the Son. Today, we're going to need the help of the Spirit to understand what it is that he does. And so this is not something that can be understood by, by just then exercise of the human mind. What we are going to see, perhaps more than any other time in our preaching of Scripture, is we're going to see that the activity we will be engaged in profoundly needs the ministry of the Spirit. Let's ask for that now. Our Father, we are weak in faith. We're curious about things that you tell us are secrets, and we neglect the things you reveal to us in your word. So now send your Spirit to come and strengthen us in our faith, in our understanding of your ways and your word. Enable us even now to shut out all the distractions that the evil one will parade before our eyes, and to deeply drink from your truth. 
We pray in the name of our mediator, our prophet, our priest, our king, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Look with me at verse 26 and 27 in your Bible. Jesus begins by talking about the authority of the Holy Spirit. The disciples, as I've mentioned in chapter 14, they're fearful that they're going to be abandoned because Jesus has told them he's going away. But Jesus reassures them by telling them that the Spirit will come and they will not be shortchanged by that. The Spirit comes not as a lone ranger, but by the Father in the name of the Son. Look carefully at verse 26 when Jesus says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Do you notice that? The Spirit is, is coming by an act of sending of the Father and the Spirit. And this is what the older theologians call the pactum salutis, or the covenant of redemption, that holy eternal agreement between the persons of the Trinity. Now, if you ask, when did the Father, the Son, and the Spirit cook up this idea of redemption and what each person of the Godhead would do? Well, this is what the covenant of redemption discusses, that the idea that the eternal decree, the agreement of each of the persons. And so listen to what we would say is an orthodox understanding of that covenant of redemption. On the part of the Father, the covenant of redemption included an agreement to give the Son to a people he would redeem for his own possession, to send the Son to be their representative, to prepare a body for the Son to dwell in as a man, to accept him as the representative of his people whom he had redeemed, to give him all authority in heaven and on earth, and including the authority to pour out the Holy Spirit in power to apply redemption to his people. That's, that's the function of the Father in our redemption. Then there's the function of the Son. On the part of the Son, there was an agreement that he would come into the world and live as a man under the law. And that he would be perfectly obedient to all the commands of the Father. That he would become obedient even to the point of death, the death of the cross. And the Son also agreed that he would gather for himself a people in order that none whom the Father had given him would be lost. And then on the part of the Spirit, do you notice this holy division of labor? The role of the Spirit, he agreed to do the will of the Father, to fill and empower Christ to carry out his ministry on earth and to apply the benefits of Christ's redemptive work to his people after Christ returned to heaven. And so notice in verse 26, when Jesus says that the Spirit will come in his name, this is in distinction to those who will come in Jesus' name, but they're not sent. Now let me show you the distinction. Keep one finger here and look at Mark chapter 13. Mark 13 In verse 5, Jesus tells us of those who will come in his name, but they weren't sent. Mark 13, verse 5 and 6, Jesus answering them began to to say, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and he will deceive many. These people obviously weren't sent. They have no authority. Never be surprised at such men. One of the things that I've been studying, speaking to you frequently about for the last few years, is the massive presence of wolves in the, in the New Covenant age. Paul, you remember his last conversation with the Ephesian elders on the beach. He said, they'll rise up from the inside of the church and come from the outside of the church. So never be surprised at such men. There are many of them. Don't be gullible and naive. And say things like, well, he said he's from Christ. He said he has a message from God. You're commanded in 1 John and other texts to test the spirits. And here you are forewarned by Jesus. But the spirit has legitimate authority. Look at verse 26. Here's his authority. Because he's sent by the Father. And he comes in the name of the Son. He is Christ's representative. Think about an illustration from the world of diplomacy. When one of our national ambassadors enters into negotiations with a particular country, what kind of authority does he have? He represents the United States of America, the ambassador. He speaks the mind and will of the governing power of the U.S. Just so, 
the Spirit comes as the divine representative of Jesus and speaks the mind and will of Christ. Now notice as well something about the nature of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 26. Jesus says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, this is, you can mark it down, this is the first time in John's Gospel that the third person of the Trinity is called this name, the Holy Spirit. Think of some of the other titles, and there are many, of the third person of the Godhead. He is designated, for example, simply as the Spirit, which clearly expresses that he has no material or corporeal substance, no physical properties. That's why Jesus tells the, the Samaritan woman, God is spirit. This title expresses his mode of operations on the hearts of the people of God, which is compared to breath or wind. They're invisible but vital. Another name for the spirit. He is called God's good spirit in Psalm 143. This is to emphasize his nature, which is essentially good, for no one is good but that is God. We see his goodness overflowing into the lives of his people when he comes to take up residence in them. The fruit of the Spirit is goodness. A third name. <clears throat> He's called frequently the Spirit of Christ because he is sent by Christ and furthers his cause on earth. He is called <clears throat> by Jesus most frequently in the Upper Room Discourse, the Helper which is a translation of the paraclete. The paraclete is one who comes alongside of and strengthens. He gives strength when weak, courage when timid. He guides into truth when men are confused. Before our conversion, he helps us by convicting us of sin. During our conversion, he helps us by regenerating us and giving us a new heart. After our conversion, he helps us by indwelling us, sanctifying and teaching us and helping us to pray. <coughs> My favorite title is the Spirit is often called our guarantee. In 2 Corinthians and Ephesians, a guarantee or an earnest is a down payment that promises the full payment will be made. The Holy Spirit himself is the, is the pledge, the guarantee that God will give to us all he has promised. We will receive the full inheritance. The gifts of the Spirit are not the guarantee. The person of the Spirit is the guarantee. He's the down payment. Well, let me tell you why this title is so important. Look carefully at verse 26. As I said, this is the first time he's called the Holy Spirit. First of all, this teaches us something profound about the third person of the Trinity. He, because he's given the name the Holy Spirit, this means he is completely sinless and morally pure. Now, we already know that about both of the other persons of the Godhead. We are, we are told, for example, that the first person of the Godhead is holy. Jesus, on this, in the same night, in the same evening, he will cry out to the Father, and he will address him in John 17 as Holy Father. By the way, that's why it's always a poor idea and really bad theology to equate the Pope with God the Father by giving the Pope the title Holy Father. Jesus reserves that for the first person of the Godhead. Then the Son is holy. Even the demons recognize that. You remember in Mark chapter 1, the, the demons say, we know who you are, Jesus. You're the Holy One of God. But now we find out, look at verse 26, that the Spirit is co-equal with the Father and the Son, and he's also perfectly holy. This is why, by the way, the angels who encircle the throne of God were told in Isaiah 6, they're so stunned with this, all they can say is they can repeat over and over again the triune chant, holy, holy, holy. Well, the second reason why he's called the Holy Spirit, not only is he holy, but he takes the leading part in the work of making others holy, namely that work of sanctification. The Spirit is at work in us, producing spiritual fruit such as love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. He's at work in us and giving us a delight in obeying the commands of God. And now comes that glorious truth that you and I need to know. We are told by Jesus, not just that the Spirit indwells, 
We are told what it is he will be doing. Some of you have been told, well, what the Spirit will do when he comes in is he'll give you health and wealth. What the Spirit will do is he will make you jump a pew and roll down the aisle. No, look at verse 26. What are we told that the Spirit will do? He will teach you all things. In other words, what Jesus is saying is this is the Spirit's, his full-time job, is giving you insight and understanding of the text of Scripture. When the Spirit teaches, he excites an interest in the Scripture. Show me a man who has no interest in the Bible, and I'll show you a man who's not indwelled by the Spirit. Because when the Spirit indwells a man, and that's every believer, he stirs up a passion to study and read and memorize and meditate upon the Scripture. And when the Spirit teaches, he gives men a teachable heart. He leads men to grasp the true and single meaning of the text of Scripture. When the Spirit teaches, men are humbled. Because knowledge apart from the Spirit's work, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, just simply puffs up. But when the Spirit comes and teaches a man, the Spirit reveals a man's ignorance and he abases him. Listen to John the Baptist. He who comes after me, I'm not worthy to loose his sandal strap. That's a spirit indwelt, spirit taught man. Listen to Paul, who'd been instructed by the Spirit, the greatest theologian and preacher of the new covenant, who says, I'm the least of all the saints. Because the Spirit is omnipresent and sovereign, he's not confined to the classroom. He might teach the meaning of a text of Scripture to a believer on a hospital bed, or at a graveside, or in a worship service, or while reading the Bible at home. The Holy Spirit is such an astounding teacher, he can teach truths to 10-year-olds that he won't teach to 80-year-olds. He has a specific learning plan for each believer. Some seem to learn lessons about sovereignty, for example, easily and early, while others only grasp it late in life. Why? The Spirit's not pre pleased to press it home to him until then. And when the Holy Spirit teaches, does that function that Jesus speaks of in verse 26, he always, in every case, clears up doubt. Martin Luther said, the Holy Spirit is not a skeptic. When the Holy Spirit teaches a man, he brings with it certainty. Part of the makeup of the postmodern worldview today that we live in, that is driving the progressive agenda in the culture and the church, is the celebration of doubt and the condemnation of intellectual certainty as arrogance. I remember the first time I heard this about 60 or 17 years ago, I was having a conversation about salvation with a young man, and he said, do you mean to tell me that there is only one way to heaven, and that is through faith in Jesus Christ alone? I said, yes, you've grasped it. And he said, that is the most arrogant thing I've ever heard. I said, tell me what your view of salvation is. I don't know. I have no idea. And I doubt everything. That's, a, that's the poster child for postmodernism. Well, when the Spirit teaches a man, he nails down biblical truths. A man taught by the Spirit won't question his understanding. Another way of saying this is that the Holy Spirit is an effectual teacher. When he wants the believer to grasp a truth, he will not be denied. Some teachers just can't get concepts across to slow learners not the Holy Spirit. Another thing you should know about the Spirit's teaching. The Spirit never teaches error. When you see a man in gross error, you can be sure he's not been taught by the Holy Spirit. Now remember, the Spirit's the Spirit of truth. That man who holds to gross error, he discovered that doctrine on his own. Sadly, some of the most egregious errors being promoted in our day are promoted under the banner of the Holy Spirit. This understanding, rightly grasped, that the Spirit is our teacher, ought to. If you think, that's right, I think the Spirit has really done a good job with me, then you've misunderstood the role of the Holy Spirit as teacher because this always should humble us into the dust. Don't beat folks over the head with Reformed doctrine and say, what are you, stupid? Why aren't you getting this? My friend, if you or I understand anything. It's only because the Holy Spirit is graciously, sovereignly, patiently, 
opened our eyes and taught us. But this isn't enough. The Lord Jesus has much more for the Spirit to do. Look at verse 26 as well. We read, He will teach you all things and... Don't you love the infomercials? You can do this for $19.99, but wait, there's more. This is Jesus' infomercial. Uh, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth, but wait. I know that some of you are forgetful, and so I'm going to give the Spirit to do more. He says here in verse 26 that the Holy Spirit, when he comes in, will also bring to the remembrance of believers truths that he previously taught them. Now, why do you and I need the Spirit's reminding work? Well, at least three reasons. First of all, because we are so prone to forgetfulness. Some of you have heard 20, 30, 50 lessons or sermons on the sovereignty of God, and you'll come to one of the pastors or elders and say, why why do we believe that God is in control of all things? I think of the widow who came to me a few weeks after the death of her husband. And I had just preached several sermons on death, the intermediate state, heaven, the resurrection. And she came up to me and she said, I I don't think you've ever talked about this, but tell me again, will I see my husband in glory? I thought this is a woman who needs the reminding work of the Holy Spirit. The first reason why we need this, and don't be cocky and say, I never forget anything. This is a mind like a steel trap. Well, the first reason, my proud friend, that we need the Spirit's reminding work is because you and I are so prone to forgetfulness. The second reason why is because we learn certain things at times when they just don't seem to be needed by us. But the Spirit is storing them up to remind us of those truths later. I had the man who years ago, it's about 15 years ago on Sunday nights, I did a series on trials and affliction. And the man came to me and said, I don't need this series on trials and affliction. I never have them. And I said, you will. And sure enough, a couple of years later, it was a couple of years later, it was like the floodgates opened. And as we talked, I said, do you remember those sermons on trials and affliction? I'm going to pray this way for you that the Spirit will bring them to your remembrance. Or the woman who was single who, when we were teaching on Christian marriage, said, can you give me something practical? This isn't for me. I said, you you may need it in the future. And sure enough, she was married a few years later, and she said, yeah, I'm, I'm asking the Lord to bring those truths to my remembrance. But then there's a third reason why we need the Spirit to bring truths to our remembrance is because sometimes we try to sinfully suppress the truth of the word, but the spirit who is sovereign will keep on reminding you. Think of how great a link Jesus is going to to ensure his disciples have the truth. If they're ignorant, the spirit will teach them. If they're forgetful of what the spirit has taught them, the spirit will remind them. Has Jesus actually done this? Has he actually followed through? He's telling his disciples he's he's going to bring truth to their remembrance. Does the Spirit have a track record, a history of keeping this promise that Jesus made? Because look at verse 26. It's a promise. Jesus says, I'm going to give you the Spirit to do this. Let's see it at work. Look at John chapter 2. Look backwards. And what I want you to do, as in all cases, is see that Jesus always keeps his word. He does send the Spirit to remind his people of truth. John 2, verse 14, we read, He found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned their tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Here comes the punchline. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered 
that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus said. How did they all, all 11 of them, <coughs> collectively remember that incident that had happened three years earlier and the exact words of Jesus? The Holy Spirit brought it to their remembrance, just as Jesus said he would. Look at another example. By the way, you can multiply this by a bazillion in the New Testament. Look at John chapter 12. Another example. John 12, verse 12. Because what I want you to see is how frequently the Spirit is either teaching or bringing to remembrance the teaching of Christ. John 12, verse 12. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered those things that were written about him and they had done those things to him. How did they remember? The Spirit came and worked in them collectively to remind them. Jesus kept his promise. The Spirit did what Jesus promised he would do. Now there's another aspect of the Spirit's remembrance work that is so vital for us. And that is in the writing of Holy Scripture. This is how we know the Gospels especially are inerrant and reliable. You'll hear critics of the scripture, such as the infamous Jesus seminar, frequently saying something like, the gospels are certainly deeply flawed. For no man could remember word for word, teachings, conversations, persons, and events. But this objection does not take into account the promise of the Holy Spirit's bringing to remembrance, look at what Jesus says in verse 26, all things that I have said to you. Look at verse 26 in our text. What does Jesus promise specifically the Spirit will do at the end of verse 26? He'll bring to your remembrance all things that I have said. How could the gospel writers, how could these men remember everything in such detail? The Spirit's reminding work. Can the Spirit do that perfectly? Well, he's God. He's omniscient. He can still work in the minds and memories of the apostles. He can superintend the writing that we have a perfect product. Don't take the Spirit's reminding work lightly. This is how and why you have an inerrant Bible. Let's think of the present implications of this promise. The Spirit will bring to your remembrance, believer, the word. But there's a massive caveat here. You must have read it or learned it first. The Spirit cannot, will not enable you to remember what you've never read or heard. Parents, this is why it's so important right now when your children are young to fill your children's head with Scripture now. It's there, and the Spirit can bring it to their remembrance later. I've told the story about a hundred times, but it's so delightful. Jay Adams was counseling a couple whose marriage was falling apart. And the husband was having affairs, spending all his money and driving the family into bankruptcy and he was a drunk. And so the couple came in for their last hurrah. Wife is sitting there convulsed in tears and the husband sitting over here across the room surly with his arms folded. And Jay pleads with the man to repent. The man finally just says, listen, I'm not going to repent. I don't want to be married. I want to be a womanizer. I want to be a drunk. I'm leaving and you will never see me again. And he walks out the door. And so Jay and the church are deeply saddened. A decade goes by. And one day there's a knock at Dr. Adams' study door. And a man peeks his head around the corner and said, Hey, Dr. Adams, can I speak with you? And by the way, just before the man left the room, Jay said he couldn't think of anything else to say so he quoted Proverbs 13 at the guy's back. The way of the transgressor is hard. Ten years later, knock on the door. The man sticks his head around the corner and says, Dr. Adams, can I have a word with you? Dr. Adams says, sure, just a brief one. I'm very busy right now. Comes in, sits down, and he says, um, I don't think you remember me, do you? Jay looked at him and said, 
No, I don't. He said, I sat right here 10 years ago. I was leaving my wife, and Dr. Adams said the light started to come on. He started to remember. And he said, I did exactly what I said I was going to do. Womanized, drunk, just fulfilled all of my fleshly passions. And he said, I couldn't get away from one thing. He said, the Holy Spirit kept reminding me, the way of the transgressor is hard. The way of the transgressor is hard. And he said, finally, I waved the white flag and said, I must repent and go home. That's how the Spirit works. There are other ways that the Spirit does this. When you are worried, sleepless, fearful, anxiety-ridden, cry out to God and ask Him to bring to your remembrance words of comfort and assurance. When you're tempted, plead with the Lord to remind you of strong words of resistance. How do we apply this text? We make four brief applications, all being very different. The first one is a hermeneutical application, meaning hermeneutics, the science and art of interpreting the Bible. When we engage in Bible study, how often do we leave out the most important component, the Spirit's instructing work? One of my heroes, George Whitfield, would begin each day for the last 45 years of his life on his knees, Greek New Testament open before him, praying, asking the Holy Spirit for more light. He understood that unless the Spirit instructed, he would remain in darkness. Is that how you study the Word? Or do you just think, I don't need the third person of the Trinity's assistance. I can do this. I have a bright mind. Second application, and that is for encouragement. It always staggers me when I think, as I sit down to study the Word, I have the exact same teacher as the apostles, as Augustine, as John Calvin, as Jonathan Edwards. And our teacher never changes. His curriculum, his syllabus is exactly the same. He never changes his mind or gets new or different truths to teach. What a profound privilege. I can sit at the feet of the same teacher that these great men had. And so can you. A third application, and it's theological. I've pointed it out so far 11 times in the Upper Room Discourse. If there is a dominant theme from John 13 through John 17, it is this. Relentless Trinitarianism. Meaning, we believe that the Bible teaches there is one God eternally existing in three co-equal persons. We see it again in verse 26. Look there. In verse 26, you see all three persons of the Godhead jammed together in one verse. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, the third person. The Father, the first person. My name, that is Jesus, the second person. And so pretty soon, after we get to about 15 or 20 mentions of the Trinity, we, we will start getting it and saying, I think this Trinitarian business is important if you're wondering, why did Carl baptize each of those children in the Trinitarian name of God? Because Jesus commanded us to do so in Matthew 28. A fourth application, explanatory. Why is it that some men are so biblically unstable? Do you know these folks? That they are tossed to and fro. Paul speaks to them in Ephesians 4. He says they're carried about by every wind of doctrine. They grab onto any theological fad until next week, and then they grab onto another. Why will others sit week after week, year after year, under erroneous teaching? Because they've never been taught by the Spirit. The one who's been taught by the Holy Spirit will be resolute in his pursuit of truth and his rejection of error. My friend, oh, how we at Woodruff Road, how we need the teaching and reminding ministry of the Spirit in our lives. Let's pray together. Our Father, we would ask now for an even greater and greater measure of the ministry of the Spirit to remind us of vital truths that we have forgotten, to teach us where we are ignorant, to correct us where we are in error. We ask that the ministry of the blessed Holy Spirit would be vital and deep and widespread in our midst. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Trinity Psalter Hymnal. Let's turn to Psalm 16a. Psalm 16a. Hope you want to join us now for our time of fellowship. Stay around for Sunday school classes and, of course, be back tonight at 6 p.m. to close out the Lord's Day in worship. Now receive the Lord's blessing, his benediction to you. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit and grace be with you all. Amen.